Merry Christmas! I am the Kajino Kami, and today I will be reviewing 1974's Black Christmas. Back in the early 1970s, there really wasn't a slasher genre to speak of. As such, director Bob Clark... Bob Clark? Why do I know that name? Hold on a minute. Bob Clark, Bob Clark, Bob Clark. Let's see. Bob Clark. Okay, Bob Clark. He's known for... Uh, 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 uh. A Christmas Story? The guy who did A Christmas Story directed this movie? That is awesome! So yeah, anyway, the lack of a slasher genre meant that Bob Clark had nothing to follow as far as a formula goes. The only thing that really preceded it was Hitchcock's Psycho masterpiece since Toby Hooper was filming Texas Chainsaw Massacre around the same time Black Christmas was in production. Which means that all bets were off and that anything could happen. Of course, just because there is a formula does not mean one has to follow it. It just means that there is a template to base your film off of. But does the lack of an established structure make this a gift among horror films? Let's unwrap it and find out. Our movie kicks off with a shot of a sorority house and we get introduced to the girls within through the eyes of a maniac. From there, we enter the house where we meet our cast of characters who have not left home for the holidays yet. There is Jess, Barb, Phyllis, Blair, and their headmistress, Miss Mac. Oh, girls, that's really beautiful. <laughs> Jesus, lady, I could play a drinking game just on how many times you take a drink. The morals of every girl in this goddamn house. I know a hydroxyl functional group with more self control than you. Pop. For now on, I am calling you Mistress Alcohol. So our cast is played by Olivia Hussey, Margot Kidder. Yes, that Margot Kidder. Andrea Martin, Lynn Griffin, and Marion Waldman. The phone rings. Hello? Hey, quiet! It's him again! The Mona! Everyone listens to the strange noises. Because that is apparently the thing to do. He's expanded his act. Barb antagonizes the caller. I'm going to kill you. I really don't think you should provoke somebody like that, Barb. I'll see you later. I'm gonna go pack. Claire heads upstairs to pack, only to find herself being gift wrapped instead. Who is it? The next day, we meet Jess's boyfriend Dave, I mean Peter, played by 2001's Kier Dolia. He is practicing for a piano recital that will determine his future when she lays down some really unnerving news. I'm pregnant. I'm gonna have an abortion. Wow. Can you imagine the backlash this movie would receive from the PC police if it was released today? You can't make a decision like that. You haven't even asked me. Abortions for all. No abortions for anyone. Abortions for some. Miniature American flags for others. Back at the sorority, Claire's dad shows up wanting to know where his daughter is, as she never showed up at the place where he was supposed to pick her up at. He meets with Mistress Alcohol and starts to feel uncomfortable with the sorority his daughter is a part of, for obvious reasons. I'm very disappointed in this atmosphere. I didn't send my daughter here to be drinking and picking up boys. Another phone call occurs, so Claire's dead and a couple of the girls go down to the police station to report the situation. At the same time, Jess visits Claire's boyfriend Chris in hopes that he has seen her to no avail. I thought maybe she was with you. No, not since last night. Well, her father came to pick her up at one o'clock today and she didn't show. So he went down to the police station. They didn't take it seriously. I think they figured she was shacked up somewhere. Chris and Jess also head to the police station to make a report. And from here, we meet Nightmare on Elm Street's John Saxon as Lieutenant Ken Fuller. All right, come on in. Sergeant, bring me the file on the Harrison girl. That night, things go awry as Peter completely bombs his recital and suffers from a meltdown. 
Barb has a whole diatribe about turtle sex. There's a certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. I'm lucky if I get three minutes. Yes, because I'm quite certain if there's anything Claire's dad wants to think about while she's missing, it's turtle sex. Jess and Chris enter the sorority to let everyone know. A search party is on to look for both Claire and another missing girl. I actually really love the way this is filmed. We see that Chris and Jess are talking to the others, but we don't actually hear the dialogue. It's implied, and seeing as how they just get up to go out, you can tell that something truly important is happening. That is really well done. Before they leave, Mistress Alcohol raises a red flag. I just want to tell you that uh, I'm going to go to my sister's for the holiday, so I might not be here when you get back. Ooh, I'm going to kind of miss her, but... Oh well, moving on. As the viewers know, Claire will not be found this evening, but the search party does find the remains of the other missing girl. <coughs> How did she die? Who killed her? The world may never know. Jess returns home, only to be greeted by another phone call. Hello? I don't know who you are. What do you want? If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are what a very are particular set of skills. Who are you? Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let for my God's daughter go sake, now, what are you doing? Be I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. Stop this! But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will... Thank Jesus, you scared the hell out of me. They argue about their future and the fate of the baby. We're getting married. You can't ask me to drop everything I've been working for and give up all my ambitions. I can't marry you. If you try getting an I abortion... I said get out. You're going to be very sorry. Peter storms out. Hi, Peter. Lieutenant Fuller and a phone technician show up to tap the sorority's phones. Barb, who went to bed drunk, has an asthma attack that Jess saves her from. I guess I had a, a nightmare. I dreamed a stranger was coming in my room. A lot of good it does, because the killer pokes Barb the moment Jess goes outside to watch some carolers. Best caroling scene ever! Another obscene phone call is received, but Jess is unable to keep the caller on the line long enough for the police to trace it. Seconds later, a drunk Peter calls to berate Jess, which causes Lieutenant Fuller to put a search out for him. Yes. Jess, Lieutenant Fuller, you want to tell me what that's all about? I'm pregnant. I told him I didn't want to have the baby. Now, I don't want it to be Peter, but if it is, he needs help. Phyllis disappears while Jess gets another obscene call. This time she keeps the caller on long enough. Hello? We have traced a call. It's coming from the floor below you. Get out of the house! Miss Bradford! Miss Bradford! Jess grabs a fire poker while she tries to get Phyllis and Barb, only to discover the duo are dead. Agnes, it's me, Billy. She runs away from the attacker and locks herself in the basement, only to find Peter knocking on the basement window calling out to her. So naturally, she thinks he is really the killer. Jess? 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 Jess, you had me worried. What are you doing down here? The police arrive just in time to hear a loud shriek. <laughs> 
Sometime later, the unconscious Jess is in bed while the police do a sweep of the house, except for the attic. Uh, I think that about wraps everything up here, sir. Uh... All right. But, but, no, you can't end yet. The, the killer hasn't been caught yet. He's still on the loose. Claire and Mr. Alcohol have not been found yet. You can't just leave like that. You can't leave like that. He hasn't been caught. In all seriousness, this ending leaves the viewer in shock because the mere concept that we know next to nothing about the killer, his motives, and that he gets away makes everything even more horrific than the actions he performed. The fact that Claire's body is never found is also dreadful because it leaves her dad without a sense of closure. For all he knows, she ran off with some boy. As someone who saw this for the first time a few years ago, after having seen many of the movies that followed it, it was interesting to experience the movie with no true resolution the killer at all. It makes Black Christmas stand out among the Red Sea of its brethren. It is also interesting to see one of the movies that inspired John Carpenter to make Halloween because there is a lot here that is mimicked in that film. I will never call Black Christmas one of the greatest horror movies of all time because it is a heavily flawed one. That doesn't mean this isn't an outstanding film nonetheless. Its negatives come down more to its characters and acting rather than anything else. From a production standpoint, the movie does feel like it was made on a cheap budget, but thanks to some impressive camera work and sound design, mood and atmosphere overshadow the minuscule hiccups. I really love all the first person shots used, especially the one that goes from the stairs to the attic and when Peter is walking down the stairs to talk to Jess. In addition to the camera work, the sound effects also add to the suspense, as the movie knows when to be completely silent and when noise is necessary. There is really only one jump scare, but it is effective because there are a hundred of them beforehand. As I said, one of the negatives really comes down to its characters and their acting. Jess is essentially the main character of the film. Her acting can sometimes feel over the top. Occasionally, it is hard to make out her lines as she has a habit of mumbling them, making it difficult to comprehend what she is saying. I'm not sure if this was intentional or just due to a cheap mic, but it can be distracting at times. Also, the pregnancy aspect of her wanting to get an abortion does make one question her morals, depending on your viewpoint of the subject matter. It is understandable why Peter would be upset about her decision, especially when he did not even know about her having a kid until her decision was already made. On the other hand, his his behavior just happened to occur at the wrong time, so the police believing him to be the killer is justified. Kidder does an excellent job of making Barb an unlikable brat, yet the way she dies is unnerving. As for Phyllis, she is quite one-dimensional, so her death is really no big loss to the movie as a whole. Mistress Alcoholic gets exactly what she deserves, while Claire is really just there to set everything up. The most tragic character is Claire's dad because no one knows where his daughter is, no one can get a hold of her, and he left her in the sorority's care expecting them to keep her safe. <laughs> For a movie that was released over 40 years ago, it still holds up surprisingly well amongst the other horror movies out there. It goes for more of suspense, tension, fear, rather than just being a bloodbath. And yes, the killer, you don't know who he is, he gets away, you don't know his motivations, it makes it more scary and more realistic because that could be what something would technically happen if a situation like this did occur. Whew, wow, it is really frightening when you think about that, though. But you know what? This is the best Christmas horror movie ever. And with that said, have a Merry Christmas. Until next time, bye.
certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. <laughs> Dum 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 d